Welcome, everybody, and thank you for choosing mobile technology. We know you have a choice, um, <laughs> but you won't be sorry, we hope. Um, we have two speakers I'm going to be chairing. My name is Steve Connor. I'm currently the chair of the arts panel, uh, arts interview panel for Gates. So um, uh, it's very embarrassing. People never forget who they've been interviewed by, and I'm afraid you, you quite often forget who you've actually interviewed. So I, some people are nodding. And anyway, congratulations. Well done. You got in. Um, uh, and um, we have two speakers, Eliza Ridgway and Barney Brown. But which one is which, you're wondering? <laughs> well, this is Eliza, and next to her is Barney. And we're going to be speaking broadly in that order. Um, Eliza is from Seattle, appropriately enough, um, for a Gates scholar. Um, her background was in uh, uh, news reporting, um, and she studied in 2009 for um, an MPhil here um, in Modern Society and Global Transformations. Her write-up says seems to indicate she's still studying it. She's enjoying it so much. Actually, she, she did it in a year, just like everyone else, and that was back in 2009. And she's uh, now currently working uh, in journalism and radio and advising on startups, based currently in San Francisco. Barney is um, a director of digital communications um, in our... Cambridge Office of External Affairs and Communications. He has um, a background in art education, but he's also worked for the Forestry Commission and the music industry. I can't think of a joke about um, those three things. It'll come to me later on. Need to make any money? <laughs> <laughs> yep, do. Um, so I'm just going to set the scene, um, and I might talk about the word scene uh, in order to do that. Each of us for five or ten minutes, um, and you know there may be some things that it occurs to me uh, have arisen that we would want to ventilate for a few minute, more minutes after that. But we're keen to hear from you as soon as possible. Um, so you know, once we've done that little round, um, we'll ask you for your comments and your questions. Um, there's a story about Samuel Johnson, who was a well-known hater of all things Hibernian. Uh, that um, he, uh, Boswell, his biographer, asked him, but surely the giant's causeway is worth seeing, Dr. Johnson? And Johnson replied, worth seeing, yes, just not worth going to see. And uh, that question of why we might go to see things and where we might see them, if we did, is in a certain sense what, we're, what we hope to have in play in this panel. Where is it that things happen um, when they happen in this extraordinarily distributed way, where, in a certain sense, things, news events, but also artworks and performances and so forth, <coughs> happen both everywhere and nowhere? Where does art happen? Our focus is going to be on art, but I think one of the questions we'll want to ask is, well, um, are there things that sets the th set the thing um, that we call art or artworks apart from all the other things that are made available to us through our different media and their, um, and their devices. Art, traditionally, historically, you might say, has always been, one of, one of its features has been precisely that it has been set apart, that it has, ha it has tended to happen in circumscribed, sometimes ritual spaces, as it were, magical space. It's the same kind of magical space that you have, you know, on, on the field of play in a, in a sports arena. Um, all <coughs> kinds of violent behavior takes place. But even though uh, on, in, on a sports ground, but one of the interesting things about law in most countries is that um, uh, there, there is no law of exception that allows you to, to hit somebody over the head in a rugby field or a football field. But nobody ever gets arrested. Um, actually, just on occasion, there are members of the, of the authorities who will actually go onto the field and, and, and arrest somebody um, for behavior. But it's a magical space. It's a space set um, apart. Art galleries, museums, cinemas are the same kind of world within a world. Or, or that has been the case, um, that suspension of time and space up until now. Um, we seem to be in a particularly intense phase 
ways of the diffusion of art, so that art doesn't take place exclusively in these set-apart spaces, but, but takes place increasingly at all times and in all places. But it's, this isn't perhaps entirely new. Um, in fact, it's not, it's not at all new. Um, in a well-known essay of 1936, well-known to people like me at least, um, the German theorist Walter Benjamin, an essay called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, evoked the quality of what he called the aura of an artwork. And that's, he means by this something like the sense of unapproachability or uh, a kind of ritual distance that you might have standing in front of the Mona Lisa. Here I am standing in front of the actual Mona Lisa, and yet it's the Mona Lisa that's somehow in my world. Um, that quality of aura, he suggests, begins to dissolve um, with me mass media forms like uh, cinema, because you can go and see Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall anywhere, or at least anywhere, that can, can, that can project a film. What is more, where early films tended to act as, uh, or seemed to pretend to be, a kind of broadcast or recording technology, so they might, I, they might often um, record something like a live performance, the thing that you're watching in a film, Benjamin observes, has never actually happened anywhere all at once. You know, it's all been shot in different orders. Um, so it's the kind of an assemblage that only actually happens at the moment at which you encounter it. You might actually say the same thing of a book. A book is not actually a reproduction of some other original in the way that a photograph of a painting is a reproduction of the original painting. The book you're reading in whatever, whatever typeface it's set up in, whether it's in manuscript or whether, you know, um, it's in capital letters, is the book. It's the actual book. It's not a secondary version of the book. It's sort of there. So books are already distributed uh, media. Um, it may just be, however, that we're in a particularly intense phase of, uh, in which somehow that condition of, of being able to be anywhere and everywhere, and yet nowhere in particular, uh, is coming to be characteristic of all forms of art and artistic production. This, too, was looked forward to, if I can get this up, Tappy tap, here it comes. There's only one slide in this not very interesting PowerPoint. But this is um, gone. Uh, this is, uh, I thought F5 was supposed to give you. It's all right. It's yeah. I can see in the mirror. Oh, I get all, I get all the um, interesting. So in 1933, the Italian futurist Filippo Marinetti <clears throat> and his collaborator, someone called Pino Masnata, produced a manifesto called La Radia. Uh, it's a bit like radio, but the Italian word for radio is actually um, La Radio. Um, so it's, it means something like <coughs> radiation or something. <coughs> and what Marinetti and Masnata looked to was a kind of art that would precisely, as they say, abolish the space and stage necessary to theatre, including futurist synthetic theatre, action unfolding on a fixed and constant stage, and to cinema, actions unfolding on very rapid, variable, simultaneous, and always realistic stages. La Radia shall be the immensification of space. No longer visible and frameable, the stage becomes universal and cosmic. La Radia shall be an art without time or space, without yesterday or tomorrow. The possibility of receiving broadcast stations situated in various time zones and the lack of light will destroy the hours of the day and the night. The reception and amplification of the light and the voices of the past with thermoionic valves, they sound exciting, don't they, will destroy time. The elimination, too, of the concept or the illusion of an audience which has always had, even for books, they think, a deforming and damaging influence. Um, we might, I think, want to come back to that idea of, of where everybody can encounter everything at the time of their choosing. What happens to the idea of an audience, of a group of people who will assemble in a particular time and space to encounter some object and will encounter each other encountering it, encountering it as part of the experience? Are there, will there be 
audiences? Are there already um, audiences still? Um, and yet I would, the other thing that it seems to me I would want to put into play here is um, the huge appetite, seemingly in a way exorbitantly expanded appetite that we have for being there, for being at particular kinds of events. You know, festivals get bigger and bigger and bigger. Exhibitions at the time when you were thinking, no one ever needs actually to go and see an actual work of art in an actual place and be uncomfortable and be sort of chivied along and you know, have to wait for the tube going home. We want to be there. We want to go to live sporting events. Um, so, so this may be a funny world in which, in, in fact, two kinds of worlds of art experience are maybe interpenetrating rather than one displacing the other. Perhaps we're not simply moving away from the art of here and now, but the here and now maybe is impregnated by the everywhere and nowhere. Um, I, I will just go on for 30 seconds more before I hand over to Eliza. Um, uh, the write-up for this um, session speaks about the mobile phone being the new proscenium. And this phrase, the proscenium arch, is a, is a, is a typical way of referring to the traditional space of a traditional kind of theatre. Um, I'm very um, uh, interested by this word proscenium, which actually, in Greek, is a Latin word, but the Greek from which it comes, um, suggests not the stage, but that which happens in front of the stage, in front of the scene. It turns out that the word scene, uh, from Greek skena, means, do you know, a tent. Why does it mean a tent? Well, in Greek theatre, um, the actors, there would be a tent at the back of the performing area where the actors would go to change costumes and masks. Gradually, this structure got to be more permanent. Uh, it might be a built structure, a wooden structure, indeed, maybe even a stone structure. And then it started to be incorporated into the actual, into the action. So characters might come out of doors and then it would be a building. Or they might be on the top of the skena um, and they might act the part of gods or something. So the scene, as it were, the background, the framework, in ordinary theatre thousands of years ago, is already getting drawn into the action. Maybe that's a little foretaste of precisely what we're going to be interested in today, that somehow what, whatever it is that the scene of art is, wherever it happens, seems now to be in a fair way to including everything accessory, uh, everything round about it. Um, I'll stop there. Um, I'll ask Eliza to um, tell us what she would like to, having got rid of this. Well, I, 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 want, I want to um, actually raise, raise a scene to set the stage for what I'm going to speak about. I don't know how many of you here have actually read the full description of what we're talking about, but some of you may have already viewed the, um, the sort of set piece that, that frames this panel. It's a, it's a very modern version of a very traditional concept ballet. Uh, so Sergei Poulounen, he, he made headlines. He also headlines this panel with this dance, and I wanted to um, reference some of the visual language in the piece, so I thought we could just watch a few seconds, just out of curiosity. How many of you know what you're looking at now? How many of you have seen this before? Oh, well, I'm delighted to be playing just a little bit of it then. So we're starting a few seconds in just to save time, and because uh, I wanted to um, get one of the more uh, dramatic moments. Let's see. My lover's got humor. She's a giggle at a funeral. Knows everybody's disapproval. Should have worshipped her sooner If the heavens ever did speak She's the last true mouthpiece Every Sunday's getting more bleak With fresh poison each week We were born sick You heard them say it My church offers no absolutes She tells me worship in the bedroom The only heaven I'll be sent to Is when I'm alone I was born sick, but I love it. Command me to be well. Amen. 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 Take me to church. I worship like a dog at the shrine of your life. I'll tell you my sins, and you can sharpen your knife. Offer me that death. 
very uh, melodramatic music. It's by an Irish singer who is both new and wildly popular and influential. It's, um, it's a roaring anthem. It's a gay anthem. Um, the, uh, the title of it and the lyrics say, uh, take me to church. And um, what you're seeing is Serge Poulounen. Uh, he was the principal dancer for the Royal Ballet. Uh, he's viewed as one of the, not even a rising star, one of the great stars of ballet right now, dancing to you know a top hit on Spotify, a very popular piece of music. It is not a classical piece of ballet music. And what he's doing is some very formal ballet moves, but in a way that would be viewed as interpretive or modern. And this, this um, illusion of his being all alone, it's also reflected by the fact that a friend set this choreographer choreography for him. This is not uh, a ballet that was performed in front of an audience. It, it doesn't have a historical precedent. This, this piece of narrative is just about this one dancer and this song. And the song is, in addition to be very, very popular, as I said, it was also viewed by people as being uh, exciting because the original music video uh, had two men kissing and it was it was about uh, being gay and the changing times and an Ir a male Irish musician singing about it. So that is, that is what began began this sort of description of this panel. Oh, that's a good, good image to pause mm. on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this now has had 15 million views on YouTube. And just to give you a sense of scale, that is, that is a lot of views. That is viewed as a massive smash viral success. And uh, it's clear from the 4,700 comments that people have left on this video on YouTube that part of this collective delight that bubbled up as it went viral uh, comes from accessing this very formal language of dance in such a personal way. This guy, he's almost naked, and he's dancing his heart out just for you. If you're watching this on your phone, it's happening inches from your face. But I want to propose that this dancer and the director, David LaChapelle, who made this film, and the musician, Hoosier, Hoosier uh, they were already famous white dudes. They were already officially making art before this sort of indie piece went viral. And each of these famous dudes, they might have made at most maybe $5,000 off this wildly successful piece that's not enough to make rent. They're making their money from their day jobs, which are in much more formal institutions. So no one involved in this work, except maybe YouTube, is making real money or getting discovered for the first time, even though this is the breakthrough we're talking about when we say 15 million people are accessing art in a new way. Mm. The video is, though, a very spectacular form of advertising for Serge Poulounen, for David LaChapelle, and definitely also for YouTube. So I wanted to propose that on the mobile stage, the line between art and advertising is increasingly obliterated, but that's not necessarily enough to support a new, broader class of artists, or even to support artists. It's appealing to think that we, the audience, are powerful in the collective when we watch. But I wanted to ask us, can a viral video actually support an artist, support the arts? So there's this idea being sold to new, young, emerging artists to all of us. The idea is put your awesome work up online. You will make it big. You'll earn money. I want to suggest that, in fact, each of you, I, we probably don't have powerful enough supporters to make that happen. All of your friends, if you're an artist, might also be selling their Occupy tea towels on Etsy. Probably nothing is going to happen for you. There are these new promises as technology companies corporatize art, but for most of us, they might be empty. So I wanted to bring you into this. Would you raise your hands? How many of you have clicked on an ad in the last month? One. All right. So the rest of you have just denied a creator like Serge Poulounen income from their project because they get paid per click on ads, not clicks necessarily on the video, but on the ad itself. So. Next hand count. How many in this room, how many of you use Adblock on your internet browser? All right, much larger group. So you all, you're the worst. You got to enjoy this video uninterrupted by the ad that paid for it. Doesn't pay as well as clicks on ads, but at least rolling the ad pays the artist something. So you must hate art, is the only conclusion <laughs> we can draw from this. 
So I've been interviewing emerging artists who are living this change. You could call most of them millennials if you wanted to use that phrase. They're all benefiting from the fact that art making tools are getting cheaper and more accessible, often with an assist from technology companies that profit as they promote you. So out of more than a million video makers on YouTube, for instance, a few thousand are making an actual living wage directly from their work. Google doesn't disclose really detailed numbers, but we can sort of piece that together and make a guesstimate. So YouTube, it's an awesome place to build a brand, but it is a horrible place to build a business. I'm quoting there, there from a, a venture capitalist who also moonlighted as a YouTube star. So if this new platform doesn't create a viable stage in and of itself, what is it? So I have another video for you that I think is kind of a, a counter argument to an overly, overly utopian analysis of Take Me to Church. And I'm just going to play you a few seconds once again. and Lil Buck. Click on that. <laughs> yes, and we could click on this ad. <laughs> so you're looking at a couple of things here, and uh, I want to credit the Guardian's dance critic, Judith Mackerel, who made the connection for me between the Serge Palunin piece that we saw earlier and this one. Same platform, I want to say, is this equally art? So what you're seeing, this, this is an ad. There's an ad down here. This is also an ad. It is also a runway show for Rag and Bone. It's a fashion house. <laughs> uh, it's for their fall 2015 collection. And it's also a dance piece that in many ways, I think, is more avant-garde than Serge Palunin's Take Me to Church dance in part because of the formal language, in part because of the way it's framed, in part because of the music, uh, which is a much more niche piece of music from a Canadian breakcore composer. There's a, lo a lot of art analysis I won't go into here. I want to talk about the, the money and the market and the politics behind it instead. Because these dancers got paid. They did an old-fashioned, compensated job. They danced in an advertisement. They modeled in a fashion show. So I think we're seeing art find its market here on a platform where advertising is layered onto and also into the content. But I'd say the interesting thing here is not that advertising has been inserted because that has always happened. We can find examples of that going way, way back. What's new is that you have a platform, a stage, that promises artists free access to billions of people if you can only hustle long enough and hard enough with enough compromises to reach them. So I'd say things are a little sneakier. This might look like a free world not driven by commerce, but at the end of the day, you're bound by the same constraints as always, among them making rent if you're an emerging artist. So I talked to this poet, Michelle Peñaloza, and she laughed out loud when I asked her how she knew when all of her various hustles would be enough to let her survive as an artist. Poets don't get paid to do readings. At least in person, they can bring some copies of their latest book and a square, another digital device, to swipe credit cards on their mobile phone. But you don't really make money off that. Peñaloza, who is viewed as a successful young poet, says it's maybe enough to buy a nice dinner out with her partner once a year. So poets have always had to have day jobs. William Carlos Williams was a gynecologist. Wallace Stevens worked for an insurance company, Michelle pointed out to me. But here's what's new. If the artist's stage is now digital, so is this new second workplace that they're working in. And unlike in the past, a lot of the labor here is compensated in fractions of a penny at a time, if it's paid at all. You write your poem, then you tweet your poem, you podcast about your poem, and that work is not directly compensated if you're not advertising someone else's product at the same time. Exposure is not money. So this performance artist in New York, Ariel Speedwagon, told me that for her, this new digital work, it's all about bringing people in. How is your click-through rate in MailChimp? If you don't know MailChimp, you're lucky. It's a <laughs> mailing list tool. How big is your Facebook draw? How do you tweet the perfect call to action that will lead people to come to your live, in-person, ticketed event? 
When we're talking about economics and artists and culture, about who has the capital in the system, we're talking about opportunities that are still, I would argue, predominantly accessed by rich white people. Penaloza, the poet, reminded me that race is actually a huge part of this conversation because different artists have access to different communities online just like they do in the real world. The best way to make a true viral smash hit, is it on YouTube, you'll reach a lot of people, or is it on Kickstarter? Fewer people, you might actually make money to pay for your project. Mm -hmm. How do you succeed on Kickstarter? It turns out you have money and you have influence to launch an advanced publicity campaign and you have viewers who want to spend money on you rather than viewers who want to spend joy and support on you without the money. So this performance artist in New York, Ariel Speedwagon, she observed that the people who are hustling to make new kinds of art on the fringe, they're doing smaller projects because of this. Usually they can't get the funding to sustain something larger. The average Kickstarter campaign raises $6,000, but only one out of three projects raises a single penny. So it's easier and cheaper for Speedwagon to do a solo show. She has worked on grander projects with Katie Pyle, it's a choreographer, but to fund a performance for 16 dancers with an orchestra and a set and costumes, access to those kind of resources, that's actually still very restricted. That's for people like Sergei Polunin or Mikhail Gorbachev. So this is the last thing I want to show you. It's one of the first projects I ever donated to on Kickstarter and it's Katie Pyle's Ballets. And again, you're only going to be getting the audio from the laptop here, but I really wanted you to see the visual, so I think that's okay. Hi, I'm Katie Pyle. I'm the artistic director of Ballets, and I'm also the choreographer of The Firebird. This is her Kickstarter I've been working pitch. on creating a brand new art form with some of the most talented, and actually, intelligent... I'm going to turn down the volume and tell you what you're seeing. a new kind of dance performance we call Ballets. So... Ballets here, it's a classical ballet reimagined as something that is a little wilder, sometimes a little bit more sloppy, because they're rewriting this narrative for ballerinas who maybe have traditional training, but they're also something else. They are lesbian, they are transgender, they come from many different dance languages. All of their bodies are shaped differently from a ballerina's body. They move differently. And 259 backers pledged a total of a little over $10,000 to bring this project to life. And then it got written up in the New York Times. It suddenly um, accessed a larger audience. I think the time for it was right. I think maybe their, their project really showed something fantastic. Katie Pyle is still getting written up in the New York art scene, but I bet you guys have not seen her work. She is still deep in the really early hustle. And the reason I wanted to end on this ballet is because it's so different from the first two. It's still pretty white, but it's scrappy, it's subculture, it's artists chasing the dream, it's a real part of the YouTube remix also. Because we've been talking about millions of disembodied views, instantaneous reach across time and space, but I'm arguing that I think we should also talk about <laughs> all of those boring hours these people had to spend tweeting, that Michelle has to spend tweeting about Poetry Night. We've got a ragtag, genderqueer dance troupe. They're finding a new stage. It was actually a real stage in New York. They put on a real show for real people to come to. <coughs> if we're going to talk about engagement for normal, small-time artists, who I think are the ones we actually probably care a lot about in our personal lives, we need to measure the details of that digital work for them, not just for the outliers. And we should talk about what it means to find 100 new followers rather than a million, or to get 50 people to show up to your event. Artists tell me that that's actually really cool and a big deal to arts surviving. So, final raising hands. How many of you have bought something on Etsy? It's a place where new artists who are doing visual work are maybe, yes, we've got some Etsy in the room. I've also bought something there. How many of you have actually paid for Spotify instead of listening for free Spotify? All right, we've got one person, two, okay. How many of you have attended an arts event that you found via Facebook, which is a major promotional tool for artists? Yep, all right, they found an audience. And how many of you have directly paid for art, this might be a larger group maybe, directly paid for art in the last six months in any way? A lot, but not everybody, which is not, not at all surprising, I think interesting part of this conversation. That's me for Thank now. Thank you, thank you Eliza. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just pull that thing up. Yeah. yeah, by directly paying for art, what I do at the moment is I pay 
dollars a month to a collective of podcasters called Radiotopia. So that's a group of, I think it's about 15 different podcasters. And I, as, as Eliza said, it's very difficult to find funding. But actually, I think there's a growing group of people on Kickstarter and Patreon who are able to, as you say, they've built an audience already. And they say, well, I hope you enjoyed, in my, in my case, this series of uh, video reviews of board games. <laughs> if you want to see another series of these, these are expensive things to buy or would be donated. And it takes a while to, to make a good, a good review. Um, if you can give us 10 pounds, then we can bring out another 12 videos. And actually through that process, some of the shows that I watch, they're now able to actually get staff. And they're very, very keen to say, we will only do another series if we've got enough money to pay the people that are, are working with us. So there, there, are, there are good people out there. Obviously there's good people out here, but <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, as you say, um, another project I've, I personally worked with, uh, a, an online collective of musicians where we give all our music away for free using mm -hmm. Creative Commons. And then we have a donate button on the, on the website. We've had about a million and a half albums downloaded mm -hmm. and we've made 80 pounds, I think. But one of those donations was for, eight, was for 70 pounds. Just a random person in Alaska who said, I've been listening for years. I'm delighted by all of your music. Uh, here's a random donation. And we never were interested in the money because there's 30 people in the band and how would you cut up? the royalties between that kind of thing we actually thought the financial aspects of trying to deal with it would start to destroy the art form mm. that we we'd, we'd created so that's another way of saying we weren't successful financially but <laughs> in our hearts <laughs> so i took this photo the other night before rowing uh so the stuff happening in this photo that wouldn't have happened last week i don't know if anyone can guess what it is there's 15 people in this shop <laughs> And ten of them are playing Pokemon Go, right? <laughs> There's a group of secondary school kids here. We know kids love it. There's a single man up here. He's also playing it. And then there's a bunch of people on this bench over here also playing it. They're, they, I think they were about mid-30s, towards my age, over here. Um, they're all looking at their smartphones. Who knows what they were doing the day before on those smartphones? I can guarantee they wouldn't have been that many people all in one place at one time. These kids here have dropped what's called a lure, which is a virtual cloud which pulls virtual monsters towards this location, which means a lot of people have physically arrived here, and when they've arrived here, they've looked at their phones, as I did, and I learnt that there is a stone underneath one of these bridges which tells you when the bridge was erected and who erected it and the history behind it. I now know a cultural history of this bridge that I didn't know because virtual monsters are swarming around secondary school kids <laughs> all through my smartphone. So we're starting to see already, as of a few days ago, these weird cultural smashes. I've learned about sculptures that I've walked past for the last eight years to work. At least three sculptures, I now know the names of them, which I didn't know before because of this game. So how do we get there? So here's the 60s. This is Jean-Luc Godard shooting Breathless. And I wanted to talk a little... Oh, I'm walking around. I'm not supposed to walk around. I haven't got my clip on. So Jean-Luc Godard, he's not in the camera. He's, this is um, Rail Coutard, I think, the cinematographer. They wanted to mimic the news photography of the time. So if we look about how we would have consumed news, perhaps, in Britain, watching newscasts in, in the cinema shot on what were mobile cameras of the day, he wanted to try and get that realism in cinema. I'm hoping that everyone has seen Breathless. If they haven't, go and watch it. It's extraordinary. One of my favourite films. They wanted to use the mobile camera to show the movement and the realism that you could get, you could convey through being able to physically move the camera. So not having everything locked off and two shots and things like this. Using a, a wheelchair to push the camera around. I've made films like that. It's particularly very, very effective, a little bit bumpy, but it does work. They shot 400 minutes of footage to make that feature film. So that's what's called a shooting ratio of about four to one. Nowadays, people would shoot hundreds of hours to make a 90-minute film. They were able to do that because they were restricted by the money that they had. They actually used these mobile cameras because they were cheaper than using the other things that were there. And by doing that, they created an aesthetic of moving the camera, which has now led to a lot of modern filmmaking techniques. They were shooting for the cinema screen, so the aspect ratio that they, they had in mind was probably something like four by three. And yet now, 
this is a film that I haven't seen yet. I've watched trailers and I've read about it. This is Tangerine. It was shot entirely on iPhones, of which the ratio of this is 16 by 9. It mimics the, the aspect ratio of the cinema screen because they know that people are going to be watching films on these things. That is the size of it. He had the same thing. He wanted to be able to make a feature film cheaply. And for him, that was the cheapest way of doing it, using phones. Funnily enough, he watched the film back, and actually there's a lot of very traditional shots where there's people having conversations to each other, and you cut from one static shot to another one, which I found absolutely fascinating, because you think this is freeing you to create a new way of making film. And interestingly, you've got new filmmakers who think, how can I make something that looks like a traditional film, but with the phone in my pocket? And what I want to see is people taking it, doing what Jean-Luc Godard did, and say, if I've got something this small, what can I do? How, how could I possibly take film to the next level? So it, it fascinates me that the initial reaction is to emulate what's already there, rather than thinking, how can we push this to the next, the next sort of stage? That, um, this is a steady cam, by the way. It costs about 150 quid. It does the same job as that wheelchair, which, with inflation, probably costs about the same amount of money. <laughs> uh, the app that he uses is about eight pounds, Filmic Pro, if you want to make a feature film at the weekend. And then this lens that gets strapped on here turns the 16 by nine aspect ratio on the phone into like a 233 to one, so you can get super widescreen on the phone. That costs about 160 quid, something like that. Doesn't mean you're a filmmaker, of course. If this fascinates me. This is what I used to shoot films on, Super 8 camera, except that this is a new one that's coming out this year. So Kodak are producing an analog film camera this year. That cartridge will go in it. It will cost you $50 to get it developed. And they will post it back to you, and they will email you a digital file. And you think, why are people doing this? Because actually the convenience of shooting film on, on smartphones means you're not got, you don't have something like that 4 to 1 shooting ratio. You're shooting thousands of hours, thousands of pictures that you're never going to look at. And there's a growing body of people that have said, we want less convenience so that we can focus on the construction of what we're filming. It isn't just about shooting things, we want to compose things. They would rather have the inconvenience of putting that in the Royal Mail, <laughs> waiting for a lab to develop it and then post it back to see what they've shot. There is a digital screen on it over here so you can preview what you're looking at. But I'm fascinated that these sorts of things are coming out and people are embracing them much like the resurgence in vinyl, which hasn't died. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I, personally, I find it hilarious. Obviously, I, I, of my age, I had a, a Sony Walkman with cassettes in it. People are now releasing new releases on cassettes. Yep. A terrible medium. <laughs> <laughs> it destroys the audio quality, and it, and it, and it falls apart. And yet, there's, there's this fascinating with nostalgia, which, which this, this I can get. Maybe it's because of my personal emotional uh, connection to this. Um, we used to make films where we weren't able to edit, so we had to shoot in camera. Mm -hmm. So you hold down the, the shoot on the camera, do one shot, run over to another place, do another one. It's, this is with you and your friend, right? Or if you're doing a two shot, you have a remote wire, you sit and you're about to have your conversation, go, shoot, <laughs> stop, and then move the camera. No editing required. You wait for the film to come back, and that's it, and then you can project it. So people, I think, are embracing that. Interesting, Steve mentioning the Mona Lisa. So here is people looking at the Mona Lisa. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, there's a piece of research which I've got a link to here, where they took a group of people around a the museum, they asked them to study a bunch of objects, they took another group round and asked them to photograph all the objects with their phones. They interviewed both parties afterwards. The group that were photographing the objects with their phone had a much worse memory recall of what the objects were or where they were. They're passing on the act of memory to their devices. And so actually, at the end of their holiday, they have a worse memory <laughs> than the people that weren't taking yeah. pictures. So I personally think we need to have holidays away from our phones. I'm going on a two-week holiday in a minute. Not in a minute, in a week. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it. Um, and I'm going to divorce myself from, from all digital devices. Although I should probably tell my boss. <laughs> Whilst I was preparing for this speech, um, a Pokemon arrived on my desk and I felt that I needed to, to take a photo of it to show the absurdity of the situation. I mean, I thought this was a joke. Well, I didn't. I know enough about this stuff to know that it wasn't a joke where this was going to head, which is here. I've been running our Twitter account for the university for several years now. 
I'm embarrassed to say, this is the most successful tweet we have ever put out by a <laughs> long way. As of this morning, this has reached more than 110,000 people. We've had people saying, this is why I want to apply to Cambridge, smiley face. We've had professors from here sending this to professors from other places saying, another reason you should come and visit me to talk about neuroscience or whatever it might be. And so we can kind of laugh at it, but what's happening is there are lots of people physically converging on cultural hotspots to catch fish like that. I happen to know that this is a running joke, this particular fish, so that was a considered shot. It's not just his Pokemon Go. As an institution, we know that that is Magikarp. Retweeted by the Open University. Uh, we got contacted by the Department of Energy in um, America and Berkeley, telling us that Darwin was the original Pokemon hunter. <laughs> Um, this is where I think we're heading though, which is slightly scary. So this is a virtual reality yeah. roller coaster that's broken down. All of these people are stuck on this with <laughs> devices stuck to their faces, uh. looking at a virtual environment. So they can't even see where they're stuck in the real world. That, that's just a sort of cautionary tale. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? I talked to someone last night, I showed him this and he said, yeah, I've been on that. And I said, is it any good? He said, it's very, very, very good, very convincing. So I thought, convincing of what? Because I would rather, if I'm gonna be hurled up <laughs> 100 feet in the air at 60 miles an hour. I want to see what's happening outside. But he did say it was very good. The reason I'm showing it is because if we're making films now that are going to be consumed by people that are moving in the same way that the camera is moving, how do you shoot for that in a, in a convincing way? We've got new film languages basically popping out with the virtual reality really springing up this year. No one has really understood effective ways of making films within that quite yet. Mm. There are a few examples, but there's also a lot of people suffering from nausea because it isn't natural yet for people to experience that. So what's going to, what would Jean-Luc Gollard do with that? He actually got, um, he won an award at Cannes, I think it was two years ago for a 3D film he made, so he's still interested in pushing the boat out. And then we have things like this happening. Can I ask you all in each boat, can I first of all say a huge thank you for, for those of you who are here tonight. I really appreciate it. But all of this, all these cameras, all these phones, everyone filming me. But you put this to good use because I'm so sorry about our stopping flights. I'm so it's been a hell of a week. It's been one damn thing after another, as someone once famously said. But what I really want to do is try and enlist you. I don't use social media, and I'd really appreciate it if you did tweet, blog, hashtag the shit out of this one for me. <laughs> find this. This is part of it. Photographs, whatever, outside, fine. I can see cameras, I can see red lights in the auditorium. And it may not be any of you here that did that, but it's blindingly obvious, like that one there, that little red light, it's very, very obvious. So we started again tonight with To Be or Not To Be, which is not the easiest place to be able to play, full stop. But for the second time, even harder. I could see a red light in about the third row on the right. It's mortifying. And there's nothing less supportive or enjoyable than that to be on stage experiencing that. And I can't give you what I want to give you, which is a live performance that you will remember, hopefully, in your minds and brains, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, rather than on your phones. So please don't. And it will get strict from now on. They've got devices that are coming on a Monday that will have people detected and evicted. So we, I don't want that to happen. That's a horrible way to have to police what's a wonderful thing. Um, so listen, this isn't me blaming you. This is just me asking you to just ripple it out there in a brilliant, beautiful way that you do. With your funny electronic things. <laughs> my pipe and book. Um, and I, I really appreciate it. So God bless you all and thank you very much. Which leads to this, an Apple patent that will remotely shut down your phone if it picks up the sound of what it thinks is a copyrighted work, which has got an interesting clash with citizen journalism, like some of the stuff we saw from Turkey last night or this morning. Um, the notion would be if you were to walk past a cafe that was playing a copyrighted song and you were filming on your phone or live streaming, you know, a criminal act or, or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. your phone might be shut down because someone is, is playing, insert name of popular act here, out of that cafe. But what they're trying to really do, I mean, obviously, it's the reason that there are copyright implications is why they're suddenly caring about it. I've been to many gigs where the act, the, I went to see St. Vincent, and she said that you're welcome to come along to the show and take photos, but only if you use analog devices. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating to see the number of shots that people took that came along with sort of uh, point and shoot wind up disposable cameras and things like that. And actually, if anybody lifted a phone up, they were in trouble with, from the rest of the audience. They bought into that idea. So it's interesting, the clash. But yes, as well as consuming things, we're all almost becoming like this is an additional appendage 
that we naturally, if you read the studies about how many times people check their phones on a daily basis, this isn't for all of us. We're talking about maybe in the UK 80% adults have got a smartphone now. Which, uh, yeah, this is from Brave New World. Uh, yeah, just, just drink that in for a bit. So I kind of, I kind of feel like it's become a bit of a drug now, and it's perhaps running out of, running out of control. There's a lot of great stuff to come from it, but I think it needs, it needs checking. And then, yeah, that's my final slide. <laughs> it's my cautionary emoji. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to both of our speakers. I think that's we should. Oh,